Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit more from our book, Poison Power, from Dr. John Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin. And we are on Chapter 4, which is titled, Is Any Radiation Safe? We are at the top of page 99, the first paragraph, new paragraph. Congressman Holyfield called us in shortly after our presentation of the cancer hazard and expressed his dismay at our pessimistic projections. Now this is Congressman Holyfield calling in two scientists telling him how disappointed he was that they found negative things. Fucker. He told us he had been assured that the hazard level was truly 100 times higher than the level at which the Federal Radiation Council Guide had been set. He had assumed, therefore, that the allowable dosage couldn't possibly be associated with the production of any cancers or leukemias. How is it even conceivable that the top man in this country's nuclear energy development could be so totally and brutally misled and misinformed? There is only one answer. The U.S. Atomic Energy Commission had failed utterly to provide Chairman Holyfield with the real information uh, concerning radiation hazard. The AEC surely realized that all the responsible national and international radiation protection bodies were on record rejecting the idea of any safe amount for radiation for cancer production. Can it be that the dual role of promoter and protector made it difficult for AEC to inform Congressman Holyfield properly? As the chairman of the Joint Committee, he is the one American in government who needed to know the truth concerning radiation hazards. We can ill afford on such desperately important issues to have key governmental officials so totally and hopelessly confused. No wonder this ignorance and confusion spread to the leaders of the nuclear electricity industry. These executives and engineers assumed, quite reasonably, that the energy of the Joint Commission on Atomic Energy must know the facts. We readily discovered how Chairman Holyfield had been misled, and we so informed him in the following letter of December 1, 1969. University of California, Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, Livermore, California, December 1, 1969. To the Honorable Chet Holyfield, Chairman, Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, U.S. Capitol, Washington, D.C. Dear Congressman Holyfield, Both of us were deeply honored by the opportunity of some two hours of frank and substantive discussion with you and your colleagues last week. Especially is, especially is this so because both of us are intense admirers of the devoted and untiring efforts of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy to bring to light all the true facts concerning radiation hazards. The various hearings which you have held are unequaled as a monumental contribution to the public welfare and health slathering it on I guess. In our discussion you asked us a very specific question. <clears throat> How can you tell us there is a potential hazard at certain dosages when we have been assured that the hazard level is approximately 100 fold higher? We answered, Congressman Holyfield, we believe you have been misinformed. We know, that, we know that you needed more answer than that. Based upon the evidence and calculations, we knew that what we were saying had to be true. But we did not know how it had come about that this deep misinformation had come to the Joint Committee. We resolved, therefore, to go right home and find out how this had indeed come about. After careful study of many of the hearings of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, we believe we have the complete understanding of the specific nature of the misunderstanding.
misinformation. It is the purpose of this letter and the attachments to explain all of this to you. And we are prepared to defend our analysis of this situation in any format the Joint Committee would find helpful. We believe, however, that our analysis will speak for itself. Specifically, we refer to the radium dial painter studies reported to you by Dr. Robert Hasterlick at the hearings, the 87th Congress, Part 1, page 235, and by Dr. Robley Evans at the hearings, 90th Congress, Part 1, page 265. Huh. Dr. Hasterlick interpreted his findings correctly when questioned by Congressman Price. Dr. Evans, in our opinion, grossly misinterpreted his own data, but undoubtedly with total sincerity of purpose. That's bullshit. It wasn't total sincerity. Our analysis shows, our analysis attached shows both sets of data consistent with each other. In striking contrast with Dr. Evans' claim that the data indicate a threshold of radiation below which cancer doesn't occur, our analysis indicates nothing of the sort. Number one, either Dr. Hasterlick, either the Hasterlick data nor the Evans data can even remotely be construed to suggest that any safe threshold below the cancer doesn't occur. The data from both research are perfectly consistent with cancer production right down to the very low doses, and this could very well be a linear relationship over much of the entire dose rate from low doses upward. We are both dismayed that the editorial board of the British Journal of Radiology and the editorial board of the Health Physics did not catch the indefensible claim of Dr. Evans of that a threshold exists. Worse yet, we are dismayed indeed that Dr. Evans' statement that his proof of a threshold is the cornerstone of all radiation protection standards. If this be true then, there is little wonder that the cornerstone of radiation protect protection standards is made of quicksilver. We believe after careful study of this particular fiasco, you may be more understanding of our total lack of confidence in this underlying basis for existing radiation standards. However, we are very certain everyone concerned in informing you is well-intentioned. We know this information would be of great interest to the AEC, and we feel... You will approve of our sending a copy of this letter and the enclosures to Chairman Seaborg and Dr. John Totter, assuring you of our deepest commitment to constructive assistance to you in your gravely important responsibilities. We are sincerely yours, John Goffman and Arthur R. Tamplin. New subtitle. Faith is not justified. Ooh, they must have been heartbroken, these guys. There are, in addition, further mechanisms which operated to confuse the Congress, the electric utility industry, and eventually the public of the United States. Let me repeat that again. There are, in addition, further mechanisms which operated to confuse the Congress, the electric utility industry, and eventually the public of the United States. It is commonplace to find that the people in the industry, the Congress, and the public at large have an almost mystical faith in governmental regulatory agencies. That faith led them to believe that no governmental agency would ever dream of setting a permissible dose of radiation that could add one new cancer for every ten already occurring, as the Federal Radiation Council apparently had. By examining this situation closely, we have come to understand that the erroneous faith comes from the failing to appreciate what has been written in the fine print. The story begins with the emotional and vehement controversies over the hazard of radioactive fallout from nuclear weapons testings in the 1950s. President Eisenhower, duly disturbed over these controversies, 
and hopeful of ameliorating the situation in the atomic energy field, established a new agency, the Federal Radiation Council. This agency was to review the evidence concerning radiation hazards and to provide guidance for the nation concerning what exposure might be regarded as permissible and associated with further developments in the atomic energy field. It is this same Federal Radiation Council which finally set the .17 RADs as a legally permissible average annual radiation exposure for the U.S. population associated with the, quote, peaceful, unquote, uses of the atom, such as nuclear electricity generation. And here is where the fine print must be carefully examined. In setting the permissible limit of 0.17 rads per year, the Federal Radiation Council did not say that this radiation dose was expected to be safe. Far from it. What they said, in effect, was that they hoped the benefits to be received from the peaceful uses of the atom would outweigh the risks associated with their permissible doses to the population. These motherfuckers. Assets on a balance sheet. They're just willing to give people cancer so they can fucking make money. These pricks. A reasonable person, having studied this fine print qualification, might want to know how the Federal Radiation Council had performed the benefits and evaluation and the risk evaluation both so essential in reaching the hopeful conclusion that the benefits outweighed the risk. But alas, nowhere is there evidence is there any evidence that this cru critical part of the task was even attempted by the Federal Radiation Council. The public and industry not really realizing that the fine print qualification assumed that permissible meant safe. Little did they say, I'm sorry, little did they, the public and industry, know that permissible doses could ultimately translate into disaster. The Federal Radiation Council can deny all culpability for all they were suggesting was the hope that the benefits would outweigh the risks. The Atomic Energy Commission cannot escape justifiable criticism and condemnation for they have endeavored and still endeavor to create the impression that the permissible radiation exposure means safe radiation exposure. As a result, utility company officials make countless public statements and written pronouncements to the effect that the .17 RADs would be without harm to the individuals receiving this amount of radiation. Witness a typical statement by Mr. Frederick Drager of the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, quoted in the Nuclear Hazard in Santa Cruz by Harold Gilliam, San Francisco Chronicle, Sunday, June 28, 1970. Quote, There is no evidence that 170 millirads is harmful, and any new plant will eventually emit only an infinitesimal fraction of that amount. Unquote. Apparently, Mr. Drager hasn't the slightest comprehension of what his statement, no evidence, really means. No evidence here means no one has even looked. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good statement, huh? No evidence means no one has even looked. That's what they did in Chernobyl. They didn't look for five years. Considering their sophistication and the high degree of responsibility they exercise, the brainwashing of the corporate executives and engineers of the largest single industry in the, in the U.S., the power industry, is hard to believe. Certainly it deserves the number one position among the modern marvels of public relations efforts. Faced with the fact that a multi-billion dollar industry has been led down a path of potential economic and, and public danger, I beg your pardon, 
Faced with the fact that a multi-billion dollar industry has been led down a path of potential economic and public disaster, the Atomic Energy Commission could, of course, also retreat from responsibility by saying, we too hope the benefits would outweigh the risks. After all, the AEC hadn't specifically and officially claimed absolute safety, but AEC officials have repeatedly obscured the knowledge of potential hazards. The unfortunate result, even if unintended, is a widespread false impression of safety in the standards set for nuclear electricity generation and other atomic energy programs. In their shabbiest efforts at self-exoneration, both the Federal Radiation and AEC officials have stated that they were not advising the irradiation of all members of the population up to the permissible level. Amen. I apologize to you guys. I'm not reading very well. Let me read this again. In their shabbiest efforts at self-exoneration, both the Federal Radiation and the AEC, AEC officials have stated that they were not advising the radiation of all members of the population up to the permissible level. Amen. If we must all be grateful for small favors, this must certainly be one. Recently, the HEW Assistant Secretary, Roger Egberg, stated in a congressional hearing on August 5, 1970, quote, The FRC position at the present time can briefly be summarized as follows. 1. We continue to advocate the basic premise that the FRC guides must not be construed as an allowed dose that could result in every person in the United States eventually being exposed up to the allowed limit, unquote. Wow. This remarkable statement at the FRC position would be ludicrous if it didn't deal with such a deadly serious threat to the future health of the entire U.S. population. If the FRC doesn't want the U.S. population exposed to it, whatever led them to such a guideline as to an allowable exposure? A reasonable question suggests itself. If you want the exposure to be kept at some low level, why not set the allowable dose level there? Wow. I'm going to stop. Um, we're on page 106 at the second paragraph. It begins, the Federal Radiation Council antics do in many respects. And I will stop there. Um, I'll do another video tomorrow, you guys. And I apologize if I've been absent. I've just been super busy. It was the end of tax season. My birthday was yesterday. And I'm just like barely catching up. So I'm going to end here, and hopefully by tomorrow I'll be all caught up and have my laundry folded. So uh, <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later. Put your courage feet on, and uh, honestly, we got to get ourselves educated about this because the whole thing has been based on a pack of lies from the very beginning Starting in, in this time, in 1970, when we thought we won the nuclear war, we actually didn't. They didn't open up one or two nuclear power plants, but they're still full steam ahead. Jim Webb just said in the Democratic debate that nuclear was safe and clean. Based on lies, as we are seeing here in this book, the based on lies. He is uneducated and knows nothing. So wherever Jim Webb comes from, I know he's from somewhere back east. Anybody who's near there and knows where he comes from needs to call these people up and tell them that they're fucking wrong and they're killing us all. I think I'm going to have to do that in the next week. So, ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Talk to you tomorrow.